All right, David Morgan with the weekly perspective. I'm going to start off this week with the Baltic Dry Index. And as you can see, this chart goes about four years back. We saw, just looking at the averages here, the red and the blue lines are the 50-day and 200-day moving average. I'll look at the 200-day. Basically, over the last four years or so, we've seen a low around 700 and a high around 1400, again, on an average basis. What we saw in 2016 was we broke down from the 200 level, way down to a new low. And then we've popped back up about halfway through the year last year. And now we are dropping off again. This is basically a good way to look at what the world economy looks like because it shows what the goods are, hard goods, are uh, being shipped around the globe. And I want to do a little further comment about this. So from Wolf Street, we got this report that the world's largest carry container, which would be part of that Baltic Dry Index, unexpectedly has big losses in a crushed industry. Now war with China looms. Talks about what has happened to this conglomerate. And we also look at uh, what he says later in the article about one of the premier uh, shipping container uh, conglomerates has basically gone out of business. So this is not good from an objective perspective on what's going on with shipping around the world. One thing to note, however, is that we're looking at apples and oranges because as things were booming in the early 2000s uh, when China was coming to the fore and just producing uh, massive amounts of GDP year over year and a huge growth rate, especially for a population that size, it got overbuilt. But as it was getting overbuilt, the uh, ships that were transporting these containers got bigger and bigger and bigger. So to compare uh, the shipping from, say, 2015 to 2005 is inaccurate because it might take three ships worth of cargo uh, to haul the same amount of cargo that one of the newer ships would, would uh, take because they've gotten much larger. So that's something to bear in mind. Nonetheless, I'd say it's anemic at best, and of course the verification is here on this article from Wolf Street. And to bear in mind that the it is a global economic system, as we all know, and keeping in with that theme, if we look at uh, Mish talk for Wednesday last week, time to panic in Australia, what he points out here in this article is that the private debt has sort of 187 percent of their income, and basically, as many nation states, they are over indebted. And of course, the real estate market looks well overheated, at least from to some of us. Financial Review, as he uh, links here, there's a $1 trillion of Australian mortgages and some worry of what's next, which implies, of course, that this debt can't be serviced, which, of course, is kind of the idea of what happened in the 2008 uh, crisis with the mortgage debacle. Just pointing out, it hasn't been solved. In fact, the debts have gotten bigger and the powers that be have basically continued the game and expanded it from the 2008 crisis. Nothing really has been solved. And if we look at what's going on in global tensions on that front, of course, it seems to be getting more and more tense. This is from uh, International Business Times. I actually used to write for them weekly. I have not done that for years, regardless of me. War in Europe, Germany sends NATO troops to Russia's Baltic borders as the military dispute with Moscow escalates. You can read the whole article. I just want to point it out. The IBT is a good place to get fairly objective news. And uh, tensions are increasing as I speak. And it seems I get uh, Zero Hedge in every week. And definitely a great site. And this has to do with the Court of Appeals unanimously rejecting Trunk's travel ban and the full ruling. And you can go to the uh, Zero Hedge website and read the whole article. But it's rather interesting what's going on here with the uh, executive order and what the court has ruled. And I'll just throw in two cents and say, I think that this is not over. And moving on to the commodities, for those that uh, watched The Big Short or read it, you will know that Dr. Burry was focusing on one commodity after his success with the mortgage debacle in 2008. And that one commodity was water. Here's an article that talks about the water crisis by 2040. And this is the real deal. I do believe that we are facing a water crisis 
um, I don't know what year I will defer this article, but it's something to pay attention to and something that does not get a lot of, uh, a lot of press. Moving on to the precious metals. This is from Reuters and the physical gold demand slides to a seven year low in 2016, according to GFMS. Of course, there are other sources of information that probably would have a different take. Nonetheless, this came out uh, at the end of January this year, and you can read this article and it goes through it. What I can determine uh, uh, directly is that talking on the retail and some of the wholesalers of substantial size in the United States, it seems that, or it is factual, that the amount of physical purchases uh, are very low and very slow right now. Not that it doesn't mean they might pick up momentarily, but uh, as it stands as of the time of this video, um, the gold silver physical demand is actually not that robust in the United States. And more gold news. Germany brings back its gold stash home sooner than planned. This is one where I was actually interviewed years ago at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference in January, but not the latest one, several years ago when Germany was uh, looking to get its gold back and it was being held for like seven years. And then I was corrected on that, of course, by um, some of the more establishment types that uh, told me, I never saw it, but I'm not saying it doesn't exist, that the contracts were that uh, they had seven years to pay it back. Uh, moot point now, because uh, according to this Reuters article, uh, the gold has come home. So someone asked me if this is the same exact uh, gold that was uh, you know, in the vaults, and the answer is no, <laughs> it's not. I think all of us know that. And to give you a little bit on the silver side, this is an article from uh, last year, but I think it's one that maybe some people overlooked. And it is, again, for on Reuters, uh, quoting GFMS, silver scorching demand for silver set to cool. It talks about uh, the peak was 83 million ounces in 2016. It talks about the amount of silver panels that are being produced. And that uh, less silver consumption reduces dependence on availability and price developments in the silver uh, spot market. Uh, this remains to be determined. Actually, other sources that I've reported on in the Morgan Report actually shows an increase in solar demand and amount of silver. And the uh, and that's probably for two or three years. But again, uh, I'm just reporting this. I will say that uh, when Jessica Cross did her initial study back in early 2010, uh, her projection was 140 million ounces a year <clears throat> about this time frame. Now we see it's 83. And actually, I think her, uh, she had a very good handle on it because what she didn't know is that the uh, efficiencies of the marketplace that were taking place over the time frame from 2010 to present day, which means that less and less silver is used to produce the same amount of electricity. So the solar voltaics have gotten more efficient. If it was constant, then this number of 83 million ounces would be probably a lot closer to her uh, projection. Nonetheless, a great deal of uh, silver is used in solar, and I still think that will be increasing for the next couple of years. Again, uh, it remains to be determined. And finally, a rather long update, but uh, when you come to the Morgan Report, don't forget that there is a blog and we put information up there constantly. So it's listed like that. You click on the link. This is in the Prospector News. It will be circulated at the PDAC here in early March. And it just goes through this speculative situation that I've talked about on a few of the public domain channels. If you're interested in this type of thing, I encourage you to read our blog and also you can get on our, our uh, public domain email list. That's a free list, free e-letter that you get every weekend. So that's going to conclude it for the weekly wrap up.